couple of my uh, subscribers on YouTube are uh, Newell fans, Newell coaches. Newells are uh, predominantly bought by uh, NASCAR drivers. And uh, that is a Newell right there, sitting out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Is there a house back there? Can you see anything? I see a barn or something back there. It looks like somebody's living back there. But this, this coach has been sitting back here for probably about four or five years now. And uh, what a shame. So, no tag, not tag. It's in the shade. So it's probably, yeah, it's very well protected with that canopy of trees. So, But those are all aluminum. You know, they really, they do still have some of the common leaks around the windows and stuff. But. It doesn't say no trespassing. Huh? Don't go in there. Why? We're where you get shot. Nobody knows about it, dude. Seriously. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely. <laughs> the uh, big block modifieds once a year when they have speed weeks. Yep. Those are big block that turns like 8,000 RPM for 100 laps. God, that's yeah. crazy. Man. Those are some serious adrenaline junkies. Yeah, some serious <laughs> investment too, boy. Stack your trailer and come down here for a week, bring a whole crew with you. Yeah. Here racing, they came to my house in a panic looking for a fuel pump. I'm like, man, you guys got a snacker trailer, a spare car, and you didn't bring a fuel pump? <laughs> uh, this used to be a little gas station up here. Uh, it's gone now. Yeah, I see that. Look at the old pure sign up there. That's pretty cool. That's, you know, not real new, but it's pretty old yeah yeah you think they'd have a gas station around here since the tracks right there yeah that's where they sell gas there for seven or eight nine ten dollars a gallon <laughs> wow this is all public land right here is it yeah i'm gonna camp out here for free How do, you, how do you put rings on a piston or something? Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that. I'll do that. I'll put some rings on a piston. I don't have a ring compressor. Everybody's going to be like, you can't do it that way. Let's talk about these heads right here. Yeah, we'll take this. Can we turn this on? Oh, my God, yeah. Is that going to mess with you? No. You just need to talk a little bit louder. But it, it should be oh, fine. Oh, it's not loud enough? Bro? It I... should be fine. <laughs> check, check, check. Check. So we're going to... We put the old 390 in the uh, Swamp Dragon, but we have a little too much compression. These heads have been milled quite a bit down, and uh, with the 30 over bore, the compression comes out to about 11 to 1, which is a little high for pump gas. And then we bought this cam for it, and it's a little over 500 lifts, so it's a little aggressive. So we're going to work on the uh, motor that was in there, maybe tomorrow. We're going on that. But we, uh, Sort of took this apart to see what we had. Here's the short block over here with the heads off. And uh, yeah, there's 
looks pretty good. I mean, it's been sitting here for almost 10 years built. So it's uh, held up pretty good. Cylinders weren't rusty. Yeah, that's impressive. There was no rust in here? No, man. Wow. No, it's never run. Yeah. yeah. It's never been started. Uh, everything looks pretty good still on the bottom. Three rod bolts, three sized rods. So I was told that means this 73? Is it? Yeah. Well, I do not know. D3. 73. That's Three. what mine is. Mine's the same. Is it? M mine says that exact same thing on it. Sweet, sweet. I think the uh, 360 and the 390 are the same block. I'm not really yeah. an expert on uh, FE motors. But uh, my buddy uh, Roy, my brother's friend Roy was out there. He's an older guy. He's been working on Ford for a long he time. He knows all about them, huh? He knows all the codes and all that stuff. Yep. So... Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know. One day, maybe we'll do something with this. I don't know what, but... Uh, yeah, the Dragon, it's a little too much for the Dragon. A little too much. That's the Dragon's right. got a good motor in it. It just needs to be cleaned up. So. Yeah. We'll do that, clean it up. And I guess you wanted to do this uh, go-kart motor. You want to yeah. whip that apart real quick and see what's in there? Sure. You want to do that? You want to open it up? Yeah, let's open it up. Let's see what... What's left here? I loaned this out to a buddy of mine. You need to build for, that uh, thing, put it on a cart. I loaned it out for drag night in uh, South Carolina. And it came back with no carburetor. Oh, man. And uh, no fuel pump. So I don't know what's going on inside. I haven't tried to start it since I loaned it out. I was promised I was going to get my carburetor back. Because you know, uh, we want to build a go kart. I just want to buy the go-kart track and it looks pretty tasty. Maybe we need a little go-kart action. Yeah. Oh. Man, the C2 guy forgot the cigarettes. <laughs> you gotta get me in trouble now. I know. You can't forget the cigarettes. I haven't had this apart in a while. This is a pretty trick little motor. Got a little two ring piston in it with a billet rod. Should be some goodness in here. We used to be able to rebuild these pretty quick. I haven't really messed with a go kart motor in a while. So I've been itching lately to buy some nitromethane. Put one of these back together. We're going to have to buy a gallon of nitromethane. I don't know where we're going to get that. And then we need some alcohol. That's what these run on. Really? Yeah. These are alcohol motors. Wow. Well, I mean, it's not an alcohol motor right now because the carburetor is missing, but yeah, I mean, we want to run it on alcohol because it, it makes them run cooler and it makes more power. So, this is a stock appearing motor. When we used to race these uh, flathead brakes, they had a class called stock appearing. And it was anything goes as long as it looks stock. And uh, we did pretty good at this because I figured out real quick in the game that nitromethane makes a lot of power. And uh, rather than spend a whole lot of money on the billet block and the fancy flywheel and all that stuff that everybody else was buying, we just bought some nitromethane, put about 20% in the alcohol, and these little things made about 20 horsepower. And you go right to the front and pass all those guys that got four grand on their motors. We've been racing this for quite a while. And uh, finally they caught on to it and made us come up to the starting line with no fuel. Oh, wow. And they would uh, give us the fuel at the starting line. Got a little trick head there, a little port work, a little flame slot. It's been all welded up. You can see welded the combustion chamber and moved it back. All that's aftermarket. But it's a stock head. It looks stock. So here we got a uh, aftermarket piston. It doesn't look like uh, my buddy used this motor. It looks like, you know, I built it and he never actually ran it. Hmm. So that's good. It's brand new. Let's see what it looks like inside. I don't know if it has oil or not. You know what you're trying to do, yeah. But uh, you spend a week building the motor, one cylinder motor, checking it all out. It's 
depends on how much you want to do. So you got these, uh, there should be a keyway right here. You see the keyway, they make different uh, degree keyways so the flywheel moves so you can adjust the timing. Oh, I got all that stuff. Different uh, keyways, all different components. I need to really set up a little uh, go-kart area. I like messing with this stuff. I'm always busy doing this stuff now. Clean side cover. We have a uh, got a rusty shaft. That shaft got a little rust on it. We gotta fix that. You ever heard that guy on the internet when they're out on the fishing boat and they come up and the guy's like, what the hell is that, mob? It looks dead. We gotta call the aquarium. It's a big thing floating out in the ocean. Yeah. And then there's one where he's at his mom's house and a cat comes up with a real big guy. Hey, Ma! There's some really weird cat out there! <laughs> Ooh, look at that. Came around. Timing gear. Built timing gear. Happen market bearing. We got a... Uh... No, that's going to come out of there without taking the ride off. Oh, you can see down there, we got a billet rod. Nice. I don't think I'm gonna take the rod off because if I take the rod off, then we're gonna have to replace the rod bolts. But I think we can put this back together and have a little fun with it. Yeah. But it's got, you can see it's got a little uh, lightweight dyno cam in here. It's not gonna come out of the motor. Well, because it's got spring pressure on it. Now you take the springs off. We'll look at the springs in here. Got little double springs, double valve springs in here, little miniatures. You can pretty much do everything in this motor that you can do to a regular car motor. That's why a lot of people ask, hey, what's a good motor to get to practice on? Well, this is a really good motor. It breaks. You know, you get one of these and you can do all the basic tune-ups that you would do on a regular car, adjust the timing, cam timing, uh, play with the forks, adjust the compression ratio. Yeah, that's cool. Different cylinder heads. I mean, I have a lot of cylinder heads. Maybe one day I'll get everything together, but different uh, combustion chamber designs, different flyer, fire slots. This motor here was super fast. This is a CAPS block. So CAPS, he builds a uh, well, he used to build go-kart motors. I don't know if he still does. But I originally paid uh, $1,500 for this when it was a stock Briggs for Andrea when she was racing in the stock medium class. And uh, you're limited to the parts you can use, so everything's in the machine work, you know. And they, uh, if you look at how this block's sitting on the bench right now, yeah, see how it's angled, not sitting flat? Yeah. So he angle mills the head for better flow and all kinds of trick stuff. And uh, his motors used to be really sought after. And even though this motor is uh, 
you know, really fast in a serious race motor, you could still still tech it with a no go gauge for. I think it was Ivy, or I forget what the association we were racing in at the time. Let's see where this is all welded up. So I had somebody run into the back of me in a corner and broke the head off or broke the block. Oh, wow. Hit the header. So I welded it all up. You can see a little double bow springs in there. Mm-hmm. One screw trick. I can't move them with the uh, cam because it's uh, a lot of spring pressure, believe it or not. But anyway, I'll have to dig up my little compressor to get those out and some tools, but... Yeah, that's cool, man. That's the gist of it. We got a couple of these, a couple of billet rods, a couple of blocks over there. We can uh, put some of this stuff together and play with it. This is a brand new block there, and there's blocks on the foot around here that has a rod and piston in it, I think. Here's another block with a billet rod out of it. That's an ARC billet rod. And these little rod bolts, every time you take them off, you know, they recommend to replace them because it's a pretty small fastener. So I used to keep these in stock. You know, so I freshen the motor up pretty much every time we race it. Yeah. And I would put new rod bolts in it because we turned that motor 9,800, 10,000 RPMs. Wow. Um, this is a three ring motor. So these, you know, this is a more of a normal motor. That motor over there has only got a two ring piston in it. It's really lightweight. So I really need to buy a good flywheel for that and maybe put it back together and I'll throw it on the go-kart and take it out there and see if we can make a couple laps. I have three go-karts, just need to put them together. Yeah, that'd be fun, man. Let's do it. That'd be something to do. Yeah. yeah. Go-kart build? I don't think that one uh, got run. I did loan it out, but it looks uh, pretty fresh in there. You can see these uh, billet rods. The brakes don't have a rod bearing in them from the factory. You know, it's just uh, aluminum on steel. And when you go to the billet rod, you actually have an insert, an actual bearing. So, I did, uh, when I was playing with these, I did figure out that you can use a Volkswagen cam bearing in these rods. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Cool stuff. Now everybody does the overhead valve stuff, you know. The flatheads are sort of dead. But that's what I have. I have a couple new overhead valve motors, but nothing that would be, you know, fast. I know if you put that on the go-kart, you'll go you know, close to 100 miles an hour. Woo. Around about 80. That'd be scary. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty scary. I mean, I raced the uh, typical these motors over here type thing, you know? Yeah. And I would put nitromethane in them, and they were, they were okay. And I had a buddy at Sunshine Carty that taught me everything about go-kart racing and building motors. And uh, he liked this motor, this Caps block. He really, you know, he thought this was the Cat's meow. And uh, he offered to uh, take that motor since we weren't using it anymore. We were building the motors and doing pretty well in the stock classes. But he offered to uh, go through this motor himself personally. You know, he bored it and picked all the combination there. And uh, first time we took it to the track, it exploded the stock flywheel. Wow. And blew up the cover on the stand. We put it on the cart and it blew up at the track. And then he repaired it for me and I raced the uh, race at the out of Biflo, I have a dirt track out there, and it was a five night race. And uh, I won four nights out of the five with this motor. Dang. And, uh, That's pretty cool, man. Yeah, this thing was fast, dude. I remember the first time I put this on and went out there, I mean, I was, I, my buddy Greg would win all the time, and I built his stuff. And uh, I never got to race with him. I was always like fourth or fifth back in the pack. And when I got this motor, I was actually able to, uh, follow him into the second corner. You know, the first corner, you go through your turn one and you're sort of gaining speed. But when you come out of two and you get on that back stretch, I was probably going about 80 miles an hour when I had to turn it, you know, and follow him into the corner. And I was like, oh my God, I hope this thing turns. You know? <laughs> but it was it was definitely fast. Yeah. And, uh, I've never raced the overhead valve motor, but we got a couple of those. We could do one of those too. Mainly, it's like anything else, you make it as strong as you can, put some nitromethane in there and hope it doesn't blow up, you know? I mean, nitromethane's great stuff. It makes power, big power. Yeah, it's funny, they uh, actually paid to pull this motor apart. It was, uh, it was a stock appearing class, so obviously, you know, the motor, there was really no rules. Uh, it just had to look like a stock five-horse Briggs. And we won eight weeks in a row. Uh, 
Greg would win, I'd get second, and Andrew would get third. So, wow. Yeah, you know, we, we had That's it awesome. so eight weeks, you know. Yeah. So they hired a tech guy, and uh, they uh, bum brushed us after a victory, and they said they wanted to uh, pull our motor apart. And normally you don't pull your motor apart in an unlimited class or a stock appearing. And uh, they said they were looking for titanium, exotic metals, stuff like that. And I was like, well, that's not illegal, you know? I said, but you're not gonna find any of that. And the guy pulled the motor apart, just like it is here, pulled the head off and the side cover, and he walked away, gave me the $200 for pulling it apart. Wow. And uh, the next week when we came, you know, we had to buy our fuel at the starting line to have actual, you know, jug of uh, alcohol. And instead of 15 bucks to race, it was 20. And they would fill your cart up every time you'd come up to race. And then we couldn't put uh, nitromethane in the gas tank anymore. And that's what we were doing. We were running nitromethane. And the, the tech guy was smart enough to know just by taking the motor part, there wasn't enough exotic stuff in there to make power, you know. And he walked right away. And everybody else that we raced against was like, oh, ooh. <laughs> there's nothing to look at. And that guy got it right, at, right off the bat. You he know? figured it out. Yeah, his yeah. name was Dennis. He was actually a machinist at uh, Napa. He actually built a couple motors, big blocks and stuff, and one of my buddies. Yeah, you know, he, he was a little wise, you know, he yeah. caught on real quick. <laughs> but you can see these motors, are, this piston's out of the deck, you know. I mean, it's there's nothing left wow. to gain for power on this. I mean, it's hitting the head. It's That's on crazy. <laughs> so, this motor here, I mean, it makes really good power. I don't want to say how much power because everybody would be like, you're crazy. But uh, this thing's done some amazing things, this little motor. So got to bring it back to life yeah apparently you know it doesn't look like it's ever run since I built it last time I loaned it to a buddy for a mini bike race and uh, he kept my carburetor and fuel pump which is uh, you know four or five hundred bucks uh, because it's a special carburetor yeah and uh, it's got a pulse fuel pump that sits on the front of the motor so I have to pick some of that stuff up and I don't even you know it's probably not expensive anymore being that they don't even race these you know it's basically a thing gone past yeah. Now everybody's into the overhead valve stuff. So right. anything that's being manufactured is for that stuff. These are good motors though. I have a lot of times people ask me, you know, if they can get a motor to work on and they don't want to work on their car. You pick up one of these or one of those hundred dollar motors from uh, Harbor Freight and you can take it apart and it's the same basics as any motor, you know, it's an air pump. Yeah. The more air this piston pumps, the more air can go through these valves, the more power it'll make, you know. The more fuel you can burn, the more power it'll make. That that was our limit on these motors. Uh, we couldn't use an aftermarket coil, so we were limited to the you know whatever 45,000 volts or whatever this produces. Yeah. And after you know 20% of nitromethane, it would just blow the flame out. <laughs> you know, couldn't couldn't light it anymore. Uh, so the, the ignition was definitely a problem. Uh, I'm sure they make a hotter ignition, but we weren't allowed to run a hotter coil. So I might buy a hotter coil for it and a wooden flywheel just for safety. But, uh, you know, you don't want it. That sits right, it's on the opposite side of you. You know, you're sitting on the cart. Yeah. This would be uh, the clutch over here and then your flywheel's out here. So when it explodes, you know, it's just bad for the guy that's next to you or behind you. Ooh, yeah. But, uh, you can buy a flywheel, I think, for about 140 bucks. billet aluminum, you know, and it's a smaller diameter. Yeah. Come with a hotter coil. So we might do that. I haven't spent any money on go-kart stuff in forever. I know it used to be our, uh, it was the first bank load I ever got was to, to take Andrea go-kart racing, you know, something she wanted to do. And uh, she raced the little 500 over in Titusville. And uh, she fell in love with go-kart racing. And then one of the guys at Little 500 and Maitland there, I'm friends with one of the owners there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the go-kart racers go there on Friday night. I didn't know that because we weren't go-kart racers. We didn't like to go to Little 500. Yeah. And, uh, I used to go there when I was a kid. He talked to one of the guys there, and I used to paint all the go-karts there. Did you? Yeah. Oh, wow. So uh, he talked to one of the guys standing in line. Jimmy Poole was his name, and he was an older guy. And uh, he had a couple two-stroke carts, shifter carts, and he had uh, a five-horse cart, uh, alcohol cart, stock medium. And he volunteered to let Andrea come out to the track and drive his cart. You know, I didn't know her or anything, but the guy had a little 500 to set it up. Wow. And, uh, he didn't want her to race roundy round, though. They race uh, road courses. 
and he wanted to put her in a shifter cart, and that's like super expensive. So uh, <laughs> we put her in Jimmy's cart, and she really liked it. My buddy Randy and Kenny, uh, you know, I've talked about Kenny before. They had a cart, and they numbered it 86X because it was done pretty much. You know, they couldn't win anything with it or anything. And yeah. So I didn't know anything about go kart racing. I bought that. We went to the track, and we you know got lapped for the first couple weeks. And I met the guy at Sunshine Karting, and he helped me out a little bit. And spent ten thousand dollars on tires and motors, and uh, wow, we were racing every weekend. She ended up winning the stock medium class in Fort Pierce, and she did really good. It was you know a good confidence builder for her. Yeah, she wasn't really uh, great through the corners, but my buddy Greg, you know, he was a dirt modified champion, so he was like the suspension guy. And we had a crew, uh, Greg and his wife, they were used to race some dirt late models, so. We would pull her cart in after she raced it, and we would strip it down to the bare frame and clean it, uh, you know, WD-40, the whole thing. And every time it went up after a heat race, from the time it hit the track, it was like a brand new cart. You know, wow. like it just rolled off the show, and we clean cool. everything, yeah. oil all the bearings, and everybody else, they'd be racing it, they'd just be getting mud all over their cart. Well, Greg, he would scale the cart in between each race to make sure all the weight was perfect and, you know, it wasn't picking up weight or, and he'd basically just let me do the motor and he'd be like, add more power, take power away, you know, and he had it where it handled so good through the corner. She wasn't fast, but it wouldn't slip out of the line and guys would get behind her and they would, they would be pissed, you know, and they'd start bumping her through the corner. Yeah. And they would almost always, for about seven races, they figured out at race number seven not to do it. But she'd go through the corner and they'd bump her coming off that corner. And when they'd bump her, it'd give her like a shot out of the cannon. <laughs> and they could never catch her on the straightaway. So she'd drag race to the next corner and put through the corner. They'd be like, boom, boom, boom. Shoot her off the corner. And then finally the guys were like, hey, man, don't run into the back of her. <laughs> and uh, they were able to, you know, figure out a couple tricks to get around her. Yeah. But we didn't race this motor, we raced a stock motor in that class. Everything is might. They pull the motor apart every time you race it. They, they inspect it and make sure you're not cheating. And we learned a few tricks from the guy over at Sunshine Cars. We used to uh, bake the bow springs. Where you're required to run a certain installed height on the spring. And uh, so we'd take the springs and we'd bake them in the oven. And they would lose a lot of the spring pressure. And the valve would bounce over the top of the cam. Wow. And give it extra lift. Because you're only allowed 230 uh, lift in, yeah. in the stock class. So when the valve hits the head, it's close to 400, you know. And wow. the last race we went at, the guy took the head off, and the head was beat to death from the valves. You know, he's like, he's like, well, yeah, it looks like the valves were hitting the head. I said, oh, that's got to be from an old motor, you know, because when he checked it, it was 230 degrees lift. Yeah. But, you know, every time you're, the motor's running, it hits the top of that cam right here, it goes over to low. They would just bounce over the lobe and send the valve open, and you get extra lift, you know? <laughs> so, this, you know, there's all kinds of tricks like that. I'm sure they're still doing on the uh, overhead stuff. You find it everywhere you can. Mm -hmm. This is a copperhead gasket on here. So. That's cool, man. Yeah, it'll be good to see this one come back together. Yeah, this is pretty cool. This is one of the first heads I welded up, you know, and reshaped and put on the mill down at Scooters. They all thought I was crazy. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do, man? Once you get that go fast shit in your veins, you're, you're sick for life. It was fun, man. This is the first project I actually did that I didn't drive, you know. I really enjoyed tuning it. And then when Greg came along, man, he was like, he could tune anything. I remember uh, we put him in our stock car. My buddy Ron used to drive it. And I would call him a polite driver. You know, somebody would come up and want to pass and he'd be like oh, oh okay you know like that guy from the office uh, that's yeah. my stapler yeah and i put <laughs> i put greg in the car and uh i worked with him at the body shop and he used to tell me a bunch of you know i'm the dirt model late model champion and all this crap you know and i'm like yeah well i got this car it won't turn how about you come out and help us with it and he came over and he drank his coffee and smoked those cigars and he hung plumb bobs under the car and you know he yeah, do this, do that, and we put a bump steer kit in it, and he made that thing, and he could drive it with one hand. And wow. The first time he drove the car, he went out there, and it was a 30-lap 30, 30 feature, and uh, his dad was out there, i never forget, and you know, he ran the car so hard compared to Ron, it was just wide open the whole time, 7,000 RPM. And I didn't think the motor was going to make it to the end, you know, and... Uh, 
he was running right in second place and I told his dad I said I don't think there's enough car for him to win you know and he goes no nah, he won't make a move till the last two laps <laughs> and I'm thinking man who waits till the last two laps not me you know I'm trying to get to the front crashing my shit all the time yeah so last two laps he went to the bottom and tried to go around the guy and the guy drove him down into the, the you know the cones wow and uh, the next lap was the white flag lap and he went to the top and they hooked bumpers and he dragged that guy across the finish line <laughs> and uh, it was the best win we ever had with the car I'll never forget the guy from Volusia County we were Orange County boys at the time but he had brought like 30 or 40 people with him and when we won you know they all came over to beat us up in the uh, checker flag area where you take your picture well the car when you shut it off it had a leak in the carburetor and it would leak fuel down into the manifold and I put a full exhaust on the car where everybody else would run open headers and it leaked all that fuel in the car and as all those people came over to give us a hard time the fuel backfired through the bubble and went BAM and everybody scattered. Wow. And uh, the guy that he ended up racing you know for the last two laps really hard he came over and he's like man that's the best race I ever had so he was really uh, gracious about losing and calmed his crew down but that guy can drive a car, dude. He broke his neck, so he doesn't drive much anymore. Man, he could drive. And wow. it was funny, when we let him drive the, uh, the the bomber or the thunder car, he pulled up where you pull out onto the track, and one of the paramedics was like, Yeah, you're Greg Wyland, the dirt track champion from Pittsburgh. I'm like, oh, God. He <laughs> wasn't lying. <laughs> so, That's cool, man. Uh, yeah. Now Greg owns a gas station in Pennsylvania. I went up there and tried to work for him, but I couldn't handle the, the cold. So yeah, it's cold up there. I see him a couple times a year. I haven't really raced my Volkswagen since he moved. He was uh, he do the suspension on the drag car too. He was really good at it. Yeah. Soon, I don't know. I went up and built the Camaro for him, twin turbo. Makes about twelve hundred horsepower to the wheels. I got a video. I never put it up. Oh yeah, you gotta find that. Uh, it's, it's in the uh, video library. So yeah, we got the motor farm here. We're going to be putting Oscar's motor in this week, I hope. And uh, 2110 still here. Had a customer come in, thought that he needed a motor. Steven. Uh, yep. He worked on his car. It was just a valve adjustment and some carburetor work. So he didn't need a motor after all. That was good. That was this week. I still think he. I think he still wants to get one. Built he might there. still want a motor, but you know we're gonna. He's gonna use what he's got for a little while, and then maybe we'll build him something custom. Yeah, we got some other stuff coming up. Hopefully tomorrow, maybe we'll make a video of that. Might yeah. not be on my channel, but you guys got to tune in to CT and see what's going on. Yeah, we'll get that uh, so, Swamp Dragon up and Make some swamp magic tomorrow. <laughs> swamp magic. We got some uh, broken bolts to draw out of the heads. We're gonna maybe touch the seats up a little bit, and then we're gonna clean the bottom end up and uh, make that thing run. Yep. And maybe we'll find another project that we can hot rod a little bit, put this on. Yeah. You pan around here behind you on the floor. There's a uh, 90 and a half case used. No good. There's a 94 case used. No good. There's another case back there. Put it together a couple times. It's a bus case and it's got a tight spot in it. So used cases are far and few in between that are usable. If you have a motor that runs and the heads aren't coming off of it and you know, it hasn't been line bored to death, that's a possibility. But as far as buying a used case and putting a bunch of used parts together, that's probably not the best route to go, unless you're on an extreme budget. Because you're always gonna run into little issues with the line board case or a used case. That's usually why somebody's selling it, you know. Uh, they, they found something they didn't like and they chose to buy a different one and they sold their case. Very, re very rarely does somebody sell a good used case. Hey man, this case is really good, I'm gonna sell it. You know, they'll build a motor out of it. So yeah. you have to really be careful about using a use case or buying a use case. There are companies out there, I think Pacific Core, uh, they machine the cases, they do a line bore on them, they check them. Uh, that would be a resource to get a use case that's machined. Uh, maybe there's some more suppliers if you search, but there's just not a lot of companies offering rebuilt cases. Uh, new cases tend to be the, the norm now, the choice. Uh, so you're better off with the new case. Yeah, I mean, even if you buy a used case and you got 350 bucks in it, you can buy a new case for like, let's say 700, 800 bucks. You're way ahead of the game. That's gonna give you so much more driving miles because you got a brand new block, you know? It hadn't been fatigued. 
hasn't gone through a million heat cycles. And uh, you know, there's no way to measure what that case has gone through before you got it, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna put a, an engine together and you're buying all new parts. Yeah, it's expensive well, now. It's a new you know, case, you know. Well, you know how much it is. I mean, you know, if you buy a new crank, you buy the bearings, you buy a cam, you buy lifters, you know, you're, you're $2,500 easy into a pile of parts and then you're going to put that into a used case and you know maybe lose all your stuff because yep we didn't spend an extra 400 dollars and just go ahead and buy a brand new case so uh, the, the aluminum cases and the mag cases are really available you can get them from almost anybody now there was a time where the mag cases were sort of rare they were you know having a supply issue but we have aluminum cases we can pick those up from a lot of different suppliers and that's a really good choice, man. If you're going to build a performance motor, it comes machined. You know, it has all the shuffle pin, it's full float, it's solid behind number three, it's already cut for the cylinders, it's clearance for an 82 or for an 86 stroke. So, aluminum case is definitely the way to go. If you're a first time engine builder, you know, I would build something 82 stroke or under. You start getting over 82 stroke and stuff gets tight in the motor, and you have to make sure everything clears. Uh, I like the 78 crank. It bolts in. It's really nice. It's a good crank. It's not really hard on the rod bolts. Uh, it's just a really happy combination. And uh, the 82 crank really doesn't make much more power. And, you know, the rods will last a lot longer with a 78 crank over an 82. Anytime you add stroke to a crank, you put load on the rod bolt. You know, that crank has to go up and stop and change directions, you know. So... So anyway, that's where we're at with that. I was doing an estimate, trying to find some uh, high-end parts, you know, uh, I don't know, I'll put, a, put a little shout out to you guys out there that might be in the know. I talked to the guys at Vintage Speed Shop and uh, they really didn't have any lines. I need some Dickasil cylinders and maybe a used Burt crank, you know. I'm trying to build an endurance motor for a guy that wants to do a dumb ball race. So, um, I have no problem buying the parts that I usually build, but I don't know how to hold up to driving the car 100 miles an hour across you know, the United States. And this guy wants to run the car really hard. So he's willing to buy a nice transmission, five speed, whatever it takes from Rancho for it. And I'd like to build a, uh, you know, a nice motor for him, something that's gonna really hold up and be able to, you know, probably have to turn 48, 5,000 RPM the whole time it's running, so. We got that coming up. I'm sort of leaning towards CV performance. So, you know, I can go there and get everything at one place. He wants to run fuel injection on it, so we'll be buying everything from them, get the fuel injection set up, cylinder heads. I'm really confident that the motor will definitely make a race. Uh, whether I can talk the guy into giving me the motor back after he races it across the country to take it apart and look at it to see what kind of condition it's in. Yeah. I see other. Uh, that's sort of hard. You know, when you build a motor like this, there's sort of a limit. You know, you have, uh, you can get 130 horsepower on one of these and it's really dependable. But once you go over 130 horsepower, they, uh, it starts working the parts, you know. It's like when we race our cars, we, we come back and we pull the motor apart, we look at stuff, we inspect it. And sometimes when you get sort of crazy, you know, and you're gonna wanna drive 100 miles an hour for a long period of time, you might have to treat it a little bit like a race car and take it apart and freshen it and make sure it didn't hurt anything, you know? Yeah. Uh, with a lot of the engine management systems now they have, you can monitor a you know, vacuum, you can monitor the pressure that it's putting into the crankcase. So there's a lot of avenues to check the condition of the motor. But I like to take them apart and look at them. And uh, I don't mind building killer projects like that for people, but you know, I just need them to realize that when you're gonna run something really hard, it might require some maintenance. And uh, I try to stress that in my uh, videos. You uh, hardly ever see me build a customer motor with double valve springs because it's it's a maintenance issue. You put double valve springs in a motor and you're gonna wipe the camshaft out eventually. You know, it's, it's more spring pressure than that cam billet was ever designed to run on. So single spring will make, you know, you can get right out of 100 horsepower a little over with a single spring. So. That's what I tried to do with this motor over here, you know. He, he likes to drive on the highway at high speeds. You put a double spring on, you create friction, that makes heat. High lift rocker makes heat. So I tried to take everything out of the motor that makes friction and heat, you know, and make it as free revving as possible. So we'll see how it runs. He's a little concerned about me taking the high lift rockers off. 
He wanted to know I uh, took the crank out of it. I'm like, no, man, I did the engine build. <laughs> 78 by 90 and a half. But, you know, uh, here's the deal. I'm not going to build anybody a motor that's going to blow up. You know, I have to build it within the means of the parts that you supply me. A 110 cam is not ideal for high lift rocker arms. And when this motor came in, I would almost say that it was built with one-to-one -one rockers or Volkswagen rockers, maybe solid shafts with the 110. And I think the customer upgraded to the high lifts and it bent all the exhaust valves. Uh, the motor was really tight. So I tried to give it a little deck height. We put some copper head gaskets on it. Tried to give it a little space there, a little more piston to valve clearance. But when I put the high lift rockers on, I'd get to the high lift point, you know, the, the cam and the motor would almost stop turning over. It felt like it was having piston to valve clearance issues. It was really leveraging the spring quite a bit. So I chose to uh, go with the Volkswagen rockers, did a set of solid shafts on them. And I think it'll run, you know, it's gonna run really good. It made good power with the uh, 69 crank. So yeah, it should make some really good power with the stroke and crank. And he bought some new air cleaners for the carburetors and stuff. So yeah, I hope it makes good power because I told him if it didn't, I'd take it back apart and make it right. So that's uh, the one thing you got here, man. I'm not gonna let a dog leave the building. So we'll make sure it runs good. This one runs really good. Yeah, that's a beast. That's a beast. And uh, that's a beast. yeah, I, what size is this one? That's a 78 by 94, and it's got a set of 44 carbs. It's got huge venturis in it. You know, it's it's uh, sort of a racing motor. It's got a little bit of compression in it, and it's got a really nice set of 049 heads on it. I don't know how they're going to hold up, but they uh, they look really good, and people were after them, so I bought a set, I don't know, about six years ago. And I think you can still get them, I'm not sure, but I don't see them advertised a whole lot like I used to, but they're a really beefy head, a little bigger valve, did a little port work to them. This has an FK87 in it, uh, Engel FK87. Which if you put high lift rockers on it, it would be close to you know 500 lift, a little over 500. So it's running uh, the FK87 with Volkswagen stock rockers, and it came in that way with that cam. It was a motor he bought from California. Yeah. And uh, you know, I had some people help me with my bus, and they turned me on to running the high lift cams with stock rockers. Uh, takes a lot of heat out of the motor. Uh, the grind on the camshaft is better. And I'm not a camshaft expert, so I just took the advice and tried it, and it dropped the cylinder head temperature on my bus by 200 degrees. So uh, wow. when this motor came in with that camshaft, I'm like, man, that's like a drag racing cam, but I didn't question it. You know, he wanted to use it over, and uh, you were here when I fired it up. It's real snappy. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, no, I guarantee it'll go right up to 7,000 RPM with the stock rockers on it. And uh, it's going to be dependable. I mean, it's going to have AC on it. So, you know, you can't get too crazy. It's probably at the limit. So, but I'm excited to get that one in and get it running. And hopefully this one runs just as good and sounds just as nice. I'm not going to start this one on the floor, though, I don't think. Because that was uh, too much bouncing around. You know what I mean? I need to build some sort of a stand where they're not, you know, bouncing off the ground. I have the start kit now, which uh, we'll definitely start our next 1600 with that. Yeah, we need to get you a yoke. Yeah, we need some sort of a you know stand. I was gonna use the, the cabinet out there and make a make a stand out of it, but I got to figure out how to support the motor. Yeah. And still be able to use the uh, starter setup. Yep. Generally, you would mount the bus bell housing to a yoke or to the uh, the end of that stand. Yeah. And that would support the motor. With the starting kit, there's really not a, a support uh, point. So we'll, we'll we'll figure something out. I really like the starting kit and. Uh, it's great for, uh, you never know with these motors anymore, man. I never used to start them up on the floor, never. I used to put them in the car and you know, just hope for the best, and I never had a problem. I did have uh, one stock motor. We were talking about it yesterday. I had a subscriber here, and I built that convertible. It was a Mofoco motor, and I still have nightmares about that one. So it uh, drops the <laughs> cylinder every time you come to a stoplight. Wow. And the oil light comes on. Yeah, I've never built anything that the oil light comes on. And I uh, changed, like, went through three oil pumps trying to get the light out and couldn't get it out. And uh, one of my subscribers was like, hey, man, did you change the lifters in that? And I'm like, no, I didn't. I put the same cam of lifters back in. <laughs> and it's a hydraulic cam. Oh, wow. So they put in their motors. So 
Interesting. He told me that you know, I might want to try to get that out of there, that that can cause it to have low oil pressure at idle. So the customer's really happy with it, though. They won't bring it back. You know, she's like, it runs great. I'm like, it's terrible. <laughs> Even my subscribers were like, oh, yeah, I love the way it drops the cylinder at every stop. I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Until next time. Don't let the dogs get you. <laughs>